Okay, what's up everyone? Gold here. And we're going to be going over the short little five gamer uh, here on Thursday. Uh, early start today, uh, about half hour earlier, um, 6.30 Eastern, two games before the 7 o'clock hour. So don't forget about those. So we're spread out pretty good here. Um, actually, pretty interesting slate here for uh, just a five gamer. Um, in the early going, we do have projections loaded to the site. Um, we, we've we got some, uh, well, we had, today's kind of a big day in baseball. Um, we are getting Fernando Tatis back um, from his 80-game PED suspension. And, yeah, well, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll get into it when we get to the game, but... Um, Probably the uh, the closest you're going to ever come to a stone lock in baseball. Um, but we've got a uh, a lot of really attackable spots on the mound here today, and had the had had some of these games. I mean, notably we've got a, we've got some weather uh, over here in Wrigley. Um, we've got really attackable spots for Pittsburgh, for example, against Luke Weaver, um, Philly against Ryan Feltner, both arms in this Wrigley game are, are very much attackable. Um, if it were not for these types of spots, these other spots, San Diego would probably see a, a good 40, 50%. Uh, aggregate ownership on pretty much everybody tonight um, due to the mispricing of Tatis. Um, but overall, uh, we, we've got some, I mean, you could play, uh, it's five game slate, you could play literally every single team. Uh, but there are very realistic scenarios where uh, you could get to a, I don't know, seven different team stacks here um, with some some decent values and, and decent confidence that you uh, that you may be able to get there um, so a lot of playable spots here today in the early going as we can see uh, pretty flat projections on the mount so um, overall we we project to see some offense tonight and that makes for a really interesting tournament slate, despite being such a, a short five gamer. Um, so let's uh, let's get into it. Uh, we are going to to start with uh, Cincinnati and Pittsburgh. Uh, we've got Luke Weaver coming back off of the DL. He started. He was going to start in the rotation, um, and in the spring, he had a flexor tendon sprain um, in his forearm. So generally forearm injury is certainly not what we want to see with pitchers. Um, and I, so he'll be coming back today. Uh, he has made two uh, re rehab starts in the minors. Only gone, I believe, uh, nine innings, ten innings, something like that. So... Um, Ultimately, not likely to be long for this start, necessarily. Uh, he's 5,900, and he gets the Pirates. Um, but as we've seen this season, we and certainly over the last several days, as they were in Coors, uh, this is not your grandfather's Pirates, right? Um, in aggregate this season so far, 525 PAs against right-handers, 20 percent strikeout rate, nine and a half percent walk rate, 202 ISO. Um, these are big, big numbers. Now, perhaps inflated slightly by their Coors Field Series explosion. Um, but, I mean, this is f over 500 plate appearances. You can't really fake these numbers over that kind of sample. So they've been very good. Um, even though they are now missing O'Neill Cruz at the top of the lineup, They've got plenty of other left-handed platoon type of bats that they've just been shuffling in 
and most notably like a Jack Sawinski who had 14 homers at Coors. Um, they've got a lot of switch hitters and a lot of pretty pretty damn good young hitters over here uh, in Pittsburgh. So very playable have they been really all season, and that doesn't really change today. Uh, Luke Weaver coming back, he was a bullpen arm last year because he's really lost all of his stuff from his starter days. The velocity is still there, at least on the on the four-seamer, um, but it's definitely coming off from his, his 96, 97 days earlier in his career when he was a uh, top-end starter, really. Um, th- throwing to uh, a lot of contact uh, later here in his career, and it, I mean we're pushing 80% now, and this, that's really a uh, kind of the threshold we look for uh, when we want to attack. It's certainly the barrel rate as well, 11%. It's a big number, and this is coming out of the bullpen. So pitched to a lot of contact last season in a short sample, definitely. Uh, just 35 and two thirds was hurt last year as well. Uh, but pitching to a 357 average, 318 average to lefties and righties, respectively. Now, um, we don't want to put too much stock in in these short sample numbers, of course. But hard contact, we can really go after. K rate, we can really go after, and certainly uh, a barrel rate and and first pitch strike rate. These are kind of the key metrics that we want to look at when we when we don't have a lot of data um, and for Luke Weaver last season in his 35 and two thirds, uh, just the one start hard contact rates, quite elevated 35 and a half percent to lefties, 37 and a half percent to righties. He's always given up uh, a good bit of same handed power. And that's really because of the lack of a, a wipeout breaking pitch that he's never really had. Um, and over the last season and a half, focus mostly on the four-seamer change. A little bit of the curveball, but it's not, I mean, certainly wasn't very good. Um, so that doesn't project to, like, from anything that I've seen, I don't think he, he's, like, added a slider or, or dramatically increased the cutter usage or anything like that. So we should mostly be expecting heavy fastball usage again uh, and... The the Pirates are they got some good fastball hitters over here. Uh, certainly Brian Reynolds, uh, McCutcheon, Carlos Santana, all of these guys right here in the middle of the lineup. Um, they're going to hit from both sides of the plate, so we don't really you know we're not going to worry about this 072 ISO to the lefties or something when he's pitching to a 357 average. Uh, both those numbers are going to flatten and normalize a little bit with a larger sample, but. Uh, certainly an attackable spot for pretty much everybody on the Pirates here. Righties, lefties, doesn't matter. Um, so we're going to see some elevated ownership on them. They're going to be one of the more popular stacks once again today going after Luke Weaver because their pricing still hasn't changed. The only two guys that you've got to pay for are Brian Reynolds and Andrew McCutcheon, 6,500 respectively. Everybody else, I mean, Brian Hayes leading off is 4,000. But, I mean, 4,000 for a leadoff hitter um, is is a pretty damn good number. Uh, everybody else is, what, 3,500 or less, or something like that. Um, and they're all switch hitters, and they can all do some pretty serious damage. You saw them put up a couple of real crooked numbers in Coors over the over their uh, the early part of the week in their in their series. So, uh, Pirates going to be pretty popular. And I think it's pretty warranted. Um, Luke, as I said, uh, Luke Weaver's unlikely to be uh, very long for this game. Probably only go four or five innings. Now, this is a five-game slate, and if you need to get real off the board, as you may, as you may need to, um, this could be an option. He does have upside for 15 points, and at 6,000, 5,900 here uh, on the mound. That is a, a reasonable uh, a reasonable target for you. Um, not overly probable, and certainly not my favorite play, but he is going to get played and, because we're kind of starving for 
for a lot of value down in the in the cheaper range. We'll get to Ruinzi in a second. He's going to be the chalk arm. Um, so if you're looking for a, a cheap pivot, then Luke Weaver could be an option for you. And we do see that in the early going here, coming in at about 15% ownership, probably a bit high uh, in the early going. So not sure if we want to come in over this number. Um, that'd make me pretty nervous. But uh, 5,900 is 5,900, and really all you need at this price tag is about 15 points, 16 points to be, uh, you know, to kind of relief side. Um, so we like the Pirates mostly uh, attacking Luke Weaver, but you can get to him if you if you need to. Uh, Rowenzi on the other side, 6,400. He's definitely going to be the chalk down here. Um, now, Rowenzi, guy's got gas. The problem with him is... And he really can't throw the gas for a strike. Um, he's got a 60% strike one rate, which is fine. But he's really having trouble with the fastball command later in the count. And when he when he can't throw it for a strike, um, I mean, he's just it's translating into a full 10% walk rate. And it's it's really to both sides of the plate. We got 110 innings for Contreras now. Um and he's really been unable to realize more than about five, five and a third per start because he's getting into trouble later in counts because he can't spot the fastball. And at 50% of the arsenal, like you're going to need more pitches to, to bail you out of a lot of trouble. Um, and if your fastball is really this bad, if you can't spot it, you're going to need some sort of alternative secondary pitches uh, to keep runs off the board here. And that's why we kind of see it in elevated ERA and XFIP um, and a pretty low strand rate, right? Only stranding about 72% of base runners. So uh, the walk rate is high at, at 10%, and the strikeout rate to opposite-handed hitters is pretty worrisome here, just 16%. Um, so this is why we're seeing a lower median projection on him. Now he is 6,400 and he does get the reds, um, against righties this season, 480 PAs, 25% K rate. They also have an 11% walk or 11 and a half percent walk rate. So they are getting on base a little bit, 323 Woba, slightly above average there. Not a lot of power coming from Cincinnati just yet, 128 ISO but creating at kind of a sneaky clip so far, 91 WRC+, plus, a little bit higher, perhaps surprisingly, than a 25% K rate would otherwise suggest. So Rowenzi here is definitely the chalk down here, and I think there's pretty good value, of course. Uh, he's going to pop in the value metrics, certainly on the mound, uh, but there's vulnerability here, and... If we need to get to an off-the-board stack, the Reds is a, a viable uh, alternative to some of the, the chalkier teams that you're, you're going to run into tonight. Uh, because of the elevated walk rate for Contreras, because of the high barrel rate, this is over 10% as well, and he's a fly ball pitcher. 085 ground ball to fly ball to lefties, 095 to righties. So neutral, really to both sides, and... What's really going to make him difficult to full stack against is the fact that his strikeout numbers against right-handers are actually pretty respectable, 23.5% there. Uh, and the average, really to both sides of the plate, is a fine number, about 235 to either side. But he will give up some power, and that's because he can't spot the fastball. But when he does throw it for a strike, it's really kind of right down the middle, and it's getting hit pretty damn hard. 37% hard contact rate to right-handers, and about 30% to lefties as well. So, uh, And that's really the threshold at 30% that we kind of look for. 172 ISO to lefties, 173 uh, ISO to righties, right? So some vulnerability here for sure. High line drive rate to the right side also. So couple that with the hard contact rate that he's going to give up to righties, and a very low strikeout rate to lefties, it makes the Reds actually a pretty viable tournament stack here. And they're going to be pretty off the board. Um, it looks like everybody going to come in sub 10%, top to bottom uh, over here on the Reds. And they're cheap. 
as well. So uh, if we're looking for a pivot, we can get to Cincinnati definitely. This is in Pittsburgh, and PNC is a large ballpark. Suppresses right-handed power for sure. Um, a little bit easier to get there with some lefties, which is great because Renzi's not going to strike out a lot of lefties, nor is Luke Weaver. So we can target some game stacks here. Um, you obviously don't have to stack games necessarily in baseball, but uh, it is a viable construction, and it's a five-game slate. So you can do all kinds of goofy stuff, and you're going to have to in order to get there in tournaments. So um, certainly popular on the mound is Rowenzi. Not popular on the mound is, is Weaver. Uh, but attackable arms for sure in both spots. So we do need to be mindful of the ownership here on Rowenzi, uh, despite a very attractive price tag, uh, some absolutely some susceptibility here for an off the board stack in, in Cincinnati to kind of surprise a lot of people and, and get there tonight. So I think we can play some offense here for sure. Really both sides. Um, I do like Contreras, of course, on the mound. Uh, the price tag you can't really ignore on a five-game slate. But uh, if we're playing chalky stacks, we might have to get off of some of that and, and play somebody else on the mound that we're really not crazy about. Um, that said, we might not want to get to Ryan Feltner, Colorado Rockies, and the Phillies over here at Citizens Bank in Philly. Um, and uh, Feltner's really, really struggling here in the early going. Has not been able to spot the four-seamer either. Uh, or, or the sinker, for that matter. Good, he has a good slider. And he's got five pitches here, and the, the makings of a future workable arsenal uh, for a, a starting pitcher at this level. However, you've got to throw strikes, and a 58% strike one rate is really lacking in that department. It's translating to quite a few walks. It's at just at 9% in aggregate, but this season in each of his three starts, he's walked three batters per and hasn't gone more than five innings, I don't believe, uh, in any one of those starts. If he did, it was only for, it was like five plus or maybe five and a third or something. Um, 5,700 for him on the mound today. He's also one of these cheaper pieces that you may land on if you're building a bunch of teams. Um, I think I would probably, uh, yeah, yeah. if I had to choose between he and um, and Luke Weaver, I think I would unregister. Um, I'm really not excited about playing either of these guys. The matchups for them are exceptionally bad. Um, we don't want to go after the Phillies. This team is going to make a, a good bit of contact. Now, her, early this season here, 500 PAs for... Philadelphia against right-handers as well, about 25% K rate. Now, with Feltner, he's not going to throw it past him. He's really going to need to be spotting the fastball, um, which he hasn't done really for any of his career in these full 23 starts. They're really letting this kid go. Um, they like him a lot over in Colorado. He's a, he's a high upside future arm if he can get this fastball command uh, really dialed in because he's got a workable secondary arsenal here. Curveball, obviously not a very good pitch, but uh, a lot of this negative value for it is coming because he's throwing it at Coors Field and he really shouldn't be. Um, so he should rely on a four-seamer sinker slider change mix. And because the four-seamer is so bad, he should probably introduce a cutter. Um, and dropped curveball to try and flatten out some of this negative value that he's seeing on the fastball and eke out a little bit better value that he is getting on the slider, which is a pretty good pitch. So uh, he can keep the ball down in the strike zone a little bit if he's really got the slider biting and he's got the sinker going a little bit and, and feeling it. So that, that is one of the outs that he has to keep the ball down and on the ground and not over the wall. However, Doug does pitch to a full 81% contact. It's not necessarily on the barrel, which is pretty encouraging, to be quite honest, but it's hard contact nonetheless. 36% hard contact to lefties, 32% to righties. And homers per nine, even though he's throwing at Coors Field, you can't really fake these numbers. Those are fly balls, and, and they're hit pretty far. So 
1.7 to the right side, 1.3 to the left side. Good bit of power, of course, 206 ISO to righties, 173 to lefties. So the strikeouts are you know, hovering around 20% to both sides, and the walks are a little bit of an issue here. Roughly a neutral ground ball to fly ball guy, so we can go after that definitely with a, a good few Philly stacks. Um, now these guys, you're going to have to pay for them. Trey Turner, of course, 6,300. Schwarber, 61. Castellanos, 53. Brandon Marsh, who is going to be a totally off-the-board play, he's at 4,900 in the 5-hole. JTR at 5,900 in the 6-hole. So that will keep some of their ownership down, but they're still attacking Ryan Feltner, and uh, he's, a, he's a young arm that gives up a lot of contact that walks people. So... Big vulnerability here, and of course, Colorado's bullpen is very attackable. They were worked, uh, <laughs> I don't want to say overworked, because they're always overworked, but uh, they were worked pretty heavily in this series against Pittsburgh. So um, arms are gassed over here, and they, they really aren't all that great to begin with. So uh, a lot of upside here for a Philly stack, which will commensurately increase their ownership. So you're going to see, along with the Pirates, about 15... 20% ownership on the Phillies as well on most of the guys here. If you need to get off the board, play somebody that's overpriced, like a Castellanos, 53, a Brandon Marsh, 49, something like that. Or even an Alec Bohm down in the 7 hole, 4,700 for him. So uh, you can get off the board a little bit, definitely, with the Phillies. And you'll probably need to if you're if you're getting to a lot of them. Um, because some of these guys, Trey, JTR, certainly they're, they're going to be pretty popular, pushing 20% themselves. Matt Strom on the mound for them. Um, 7000 this is an intriguing price tag. His strikeout stuff this season has actually been pretty damn good. And they're stretching him out a little bit more. He did come out of his last outing just because he, he cut his thumb in the early third inning, and it was against the Reds, I believe. Uh, but the strikeout stuff has been there, and very encouraging to see him start to realize some of this as we can see here um but this is mostly bullpen outing type of stuff so a little bit noisy in the k rate but a 30 percent to to the right side 23 and a half percent to the left side um very encouraging numbers now as a starter these are going to flatten normally and, and normalize rather um but nevertheless like he's he's gone six innings and, and struck out six, right? So he's got K per inning upside, definitely, and certainly against the Rockies. Um, I mean, I'd, you and I could strike out seven against the Rockies in five innings here. So uh, pretty low upside lineup for them overall. Um, that's not to say that you can't get to some of these pieces. Chris Bryant certainly uh, their their best pure hitter anymore at 5600 he's an attainable piece and he's going to be totally off the board today he's playing in a small ballpark here at citizens bank so you can get to him he's been seeing the baseball really well to start the season he's healthy and he's always been an excellent hitter so 5600 while you kind of balk at the price tag a little bit that is playable um at w when he's healthy now cj crone got a day off yesterday he'll probably be back in the lineup he's been awful for the last month after having a like a good opening week, he's he's been really really struggling. So hopefully the day off yesterday gave him the opportunity to clear his head a little bit. Um, we don't likely want to be getting to uh, pretty much <laughs> anybody else in the lineup. However, they are retooling their defensive strategies. Um, they've had Elleris Montero in there, and they've been trying to give him a, a really good look because he's got pop. And they need some offense out of out of these guys, but he's been a, kind of a disaster on defense. So they have moved Ryan McMahon back over to third base, still only getting him as far as DK eligibility at second base, but he'll earn this back uh, in the next week. Um, and they've been penciling in Alan Treo over at second base. Now uh, he's still very cheap, and you can play him certainly, and he's going to be totally off the board. Um, he is. You can play him at second or short. Probably not going to want to play him at shortstop today. Uh, we'll get to that in, in a bit. Um, but you can play him at, at second base at 2100 and and get cheap if you need to in some in some other spots than the uh, than the totally obvious. So a couple of playable pieces over here: Crone, Chris Bryant, Alan Treo. Uh, 
um, are fine. If you want to get to an off-the-board full five-man, throw in a Jerry Profar and an Elias Diaz or something, that's viable facing a lefty. Um, but I think I probably side with Strom on the mound here. The strikeout stuff's been really good so far. And the Rockies, uh, in the early going here, 180 PAs against lefties, striking out at a 25% clip themselves. So uh, very attackable, just the 75 WRC+, plus, not creating at all 121 ISO as a team. So I like Strom here a good bit. And at 7,000, if you have an extra 600, you could probably pivot some of those Rorenzi Contreras teams to Matt Strom at about 10, 12% lower ownership. And I think that's a pretty viable play. Median projection so far, perhaps seeming a, little, a tick low, given the, the strikeout upside. So uh, a good tournament piece here, I think, uh, are the Phillies and Matt Strom, definitely. Okay, let's move on to Wrigley. I think we're going to have some wind here, about uh, 15, 20 mile an hour wind uh, directly out to center, maybe left center. Um, so we're going to see some ownership on the Dodgers, and we should see some ownership on the Cubs as well. Uh, we're probably not going to see as much on the Cubs as we should. Michael Grove has been very attackable this season, pretty much with, like with both sides, I would say. Excuse me. Uh, 303 average allowed, 376 WOBA, 202 ISO to the lefties this year. Just a 20% strikeout rate, slightly elevated 9% walk rate, nothing too terrible there, but an 080 ground ball to fly ball. Hard contact rate is really where we've been able to get to Michael. 41, 42% hard contact rate to the lefties, not inducing any soft contact at all, 10%. Translating so far over his last 42 and a third to 1.6 homers per nine. And these are all starts. Not that he's been coming out of the bullpen and has just been terrible or anything. He's really been in the rotation and kind of been terrible. So very attackable, um, seeing super low ownership on him. And the Cubs have actually been a a lineup in aggregate that's been kind of heating up. Now, they did get Oakland in their last series. And, um, you know, needless to say, like, the Oakland is as bad as Colorado, for example. Um so their pitching staff is going to solve pretty much everybody's offensive woes. That said, um, with Seiya Suzuki back now, the Cubs have gotten a little bit health healthier. Cody Bellinger is actually seeing the baseball pretty damn well. Um, he's been a good, pretty good piece and going to pop for you in the value metrics today. 3,300 in the, hitting in the middle of the lineup. I think the Cubs are a very attainable stack as well, and they're going to see lower ownership because we're going to see a lot of it come on the Dodgers. Now, if you do want to get to a Michael Grove, he's, he's not going to be played, and there's certainly upside for him for about 15 points, give or take. But he's been pitching to a lot of contact himself, 79% so far, and that's why we're seeing a, a depressed projection. Of course, we're going to see depressed projections for both arms because this is a win game, right? But we don't really want to be messing with fly ball pitchers in Wrigley win games uh, pretty much ever, so certainly if they're pitching to a lot of contact. Now, it's okay contact in terms of being off of the barrel for Michael. Um, a little bit better against same-handed hitters. It's because he's got the four-seamer slider mix. But he's really only a two-pitch guy. And a two-pitch guy is pretty much a bullpen arm. Shouldn't be in a starting rotation. And unfortunately for the Dodgers, he just kind of has to be right now. So um, very attackable with, with both sides here. If you want to get to a... Um, I don't want to say ignored. They're still going to be 10, 12%, give or take the Cubs. But uh, it kind of off the board stack relative to some of the other ownership that we're going to see on the Dodgers, definitely. Uh, or Pittsburgh or even Philly. So I like the Cubs here. I think we can get to them. Nico's been fantastic at the top of the lineup this season. 4,500 now. Price tag starting to elevate a little bit. Still playable. 57 for Dansby. Definitely not my favorite shortstop play today. Um we could probably save, oh, I don't know, roughly $3,700 and play probably a better hitter, I would think. Um, Ian Happ at 51, we like him from the left side, definitely. And we can attack Michael Grove over here with lefties, certainly. Um, I mentioned Cody Bellinger. You can get to an Eddie Rios, former Dodger as well. Patty Wisdom had a good series. Still pretty expensive for his strikeout and contact rates down here in the six, but fine and playable in stacks, definitely on a five-game slate. Uh, Eric Hosmer actually hit a bomb yesterday. He's attainable at 2,600 if you need to save some money. Difficult to stack because of the lack of multi-position eligibility for the Cubs, but um, 
and that will help keep their ownership down a little bit. But a, a playable stack for sure, attacking Michael Grove, and definitely in the win game, they're going to be the, the less popular of the two of the two teams, that is, um, here in Chicago tonight. So Jamison Tyon on the mound for the, Do or for the Cubs, rather, facing the Dodgers. 8000 for him, not wild about this price tag. Tyon has, is really pretty attackable himself. Um, a pretty neutral split guy in almost every metric, to be quite honest. And that's pretty much because he, he's throwing about 14 different pitches here. He's got six that he's using. Only three that are, are providing any sort of value. Curveball really is best pitch. Um, neutral value on the slider. Neutral value on the sinker. And the four-seamer, when he's getting into the cutter and the changeup, is where he's kind of getting beat up a little bit. Um, with a With a poor slider the cutter is usually going to be poor as well and vice versa and certainly with a marginal to bad four seamer the changeup is also going to be commensurately bad so um that's why we're seeing these values it all makes sense here nothing too crazy and we got a big sample 191 of third for tie on he's been healthy over the last little while which is good to see uh, but he's still giving up pop and we can definitely get to him in a win game with the dodgers they've still got a lot of lefties and, of course, the Mookie will um, almost certainly be back in the list tonight as well. Just got a day off yesterday. So we can go after a lot of the lefties here, and we can attack with, with them against Tyon. He's a little susceptible there. 250 average is fine. 320 Woba, it's a little elevated, but fine. 182 ISO, though, it's um, kind of the 180 threshold is, is really what we look for to be like, oh, this could be an attackable spot. 32% hard contact rate is fine, but he's an 080 ground ball to fly ball against lefties, and this is a win game, so we don't want to be messing with that. But against righties, also attackable in the ISO, 177 there, and as I mentioned, a pretty neutral split in at virtually every other metric, 22% K rate to the right side. Now, he's got good control. He's not going to walk people and put anybody on base for free. But the Dodgers themselves, they get a 12.5% aggregate walk rate so far against righties this season in about 540 PAs. That's a big number. They are striking out a little bit, so struggling to kind of get going at a 25% clip so far, but still creating, hitting for a 218 ISO and a 115 WRC+. 350 Woba, of course, buoyed by that 12.5% walk rate, but... Still the Dodgers over here, and they've got some playable price tags. They've had James Outland leading off, as a matter of fact. Um, he's still just 4000 You could play him. Freddie, Max Muncy, of course, from the left side. You can get to some cheap pieces like a David Peralta or a, um, a Jason Hayward in a Cubs revenge game. Uh, for him if you want to play the narrative so some cheap playable pieces and of course you can always play Mookie and you can get to full Dodger stacks as well they're going to be popular definitely um, right in there with Pittsburgh and Philly at 15 18 percent and that's pretty much where you're going to see a lot of uh, a lot of really popular stacks here today um, as you would kind of expect on a, on a full five gamer but uh, you're going to probably have to get this game right and unfortunately, there's some variance when you when you get into Wrigley win games. But both of these arms are attackable and not my favorite to uh, to be playing on the mound at some slightly elevated price tags for the matchups in a vacuum. And then you throw some of the, the bad weather onto it as well. And it makes them uh, pretty unattractive targets. And the market kind of agrees there. Uh, we're seeing sub 5% ownership on Michael Grove. So he's a tournament piece. If you want to get there, I mean... Go ahead, but uh, and similarly to Jamison Tyon over here at, uh, at just 12, 15 percent um, against the Dodgers. So some dangerous matchups, and we could certainly see it translate into uh, a good bit of offense here in Wrigley today. Okay, let's uh, let's get to the two thousand dollar elephant in the room. Um, Fernando Tatis is back. He will be activated ahead of today's game and series starting in Arizona tonight for the Padres um, and DK really dropped the ball here uh, they he's priced at the stone men now he's 2000 and he will be leading off he's had a fantastic sort of extended spring if you will um, call don't really want to call him rehab games because he's been suspended but um, he's been tearing apart 
the minors, uh, I think he's hitting over 500 in, in all of his uh, all of his starts in the minors here. So he's he's really seeing the baseball. He's comfortable at the plate, and he's 2,000. So he's as I mentioned at the outset, probably as close as you're going to ever get to a stone lock for a hitter in baseball. Um, even if he only puts up eight points or something, you're still getting plenty of enough value at 2000 flat to just lock him in. So, um, do not get cute with this. If you're playing cash tonight, he's your, he's the easiest play of the season. We're probably going to see him back up at 5k tomorrow. So you're probably going to get one shot at this, um, to, to play a top 10 hitter in baseball at, at the stone men. Oh, when he's healthy, uh, we don't have any health concerns for Tatis. Um, he, he just, it, DK just uh, just kind of screwed the pooch here. So um, I'm not sure of his price over on FanDuel, but if it's anything similar, I mean, do the same thing over there. So that's going to naturally elevate the ownership of the Padres here. Uh, it's going to, of course, decrease, since he is only still shortstop eligible, uh, decrease the ownership of a Xander Bogart. So he'll be, he's still going to be played, don't get me wrong, uh, because there's going to be so many Padres stacks played when we're attacking Ryan Nelson over here. Uh, a very high contact pitcher, very low strikeout rate uh, for Nelson. Um, he'll still be played, and he'll still be 15%, give or take. But Tatis, if he's if he's less than... 80% owned in any tournament, uh, I think you're eking out quite a bit of value to get some leverage on the field. Uh, I think it's a big mistake, and I, I really don't like locking hitters because there's variance. Any single hitter in baseball could always put up a zero uh, or underperform, but even at five points, I mean, you're still getting a little bit of value out of a $2,000 hitter. He's just got way too much upside. Um like he could he's one of the few hitters in baseball that can put up 40 in any given game and hit three dingers um and he's the stone minimum leading off for a very potent offense over here that's kind of underperformed so far 26% aggregate k rate now he will strike out of course but um we're not really worried about that it's 2000 26% k rate in aggregate for the Padres so far this year against righties 12% walk rate so still getting on base and creating at a 94 wrc plus so been a little bit disappointing but perhaps some of their bigger bats starting to heat up Juan Soto notably uh, got into a ball I believe yesterday uh, and hit it a real long way so starting to see the baseball and now that they've got Tatis back, um, yeah, look out because this is a with everybody hurt over in Philly still missing Bris, Bris, uh, Reese Hoskins and Bryce Harper. Uh, the Padres really since the the signing of Bogarts, um, like this is the best lineup in the National League on paper. So we're like I said, we're only going to get probably one chance to play Tatis at 2000. So take advantage of it. Uh, if you get less than a hundred percent in cash, uh, you're probably doing it wrong. Uh, in tournaments, you're definitely going to have to make decisions. And there are some other shortstop plays that you can get to, but we absolutely want to attack Ryan Nelson over here, throwing the four seamer at a full 60% of the arsenal is mixing in a f some secondary pitches with the slider curveball change. And okay value on these pitches, but pitching to way too much contact. Full 82% here in his short sample, but contact rates converge relatively quickly. Having troubles throwing strike one as well, 55%. And if you're putting a guy like Tatis at the top of the lineup on base, um, he can also steal 40 bases in a, in a season. So another reason why... He is a stone lock, and we're actually only seeing, I don't know, maybe 40% ownership. It's going to, as soon as he gets activated and, and word starts circulating um, that he is the, the minimum, we'll see his ownership. I mean, I'd be shocked if he's less than 75% uh, in in big tournaments tonight. Um, he really shouldn't be. It's, it's the freest play that you're ever going to come across, given that 
Ryan Nelson is very attackable, just a 19% K rate himself. And that's Tatis' biggest weakness, that he, he has a lot of whiff in the swing. But he's going to be able to get on base here, and I should be able to really make this lineup start to tick over here for, for San Diego. So uh, Ryan Nelson, he's going to be totally off the board. Um, does have 95 in the tank, and like I said, he's got four workable pitches. Curveball not great, and the Padres have been striking out in aggregate. They're, they have been a little bit attackable so far in 460 PAs this season. So just because Tatis is back doesn't mean that they can't yeah, that they're just going to instantly figure it out and 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 be the uh, you know the the freaking sixty one Yankees or anything like this, right? Um, so they're they're attackable because they're still whiffing a lot, but uh, it's going to make them very dangerous and n definitely not my favorite play. I you really have to cringe, but if you're building a lot of teams, you're you're likely to land on him. Um, at 7,800, at least in a couple of spots. And I think if you want to get some leverage on the field, this is one of the easiest ways to do it if you play a very chalky Dodgers, for example, um, and a, a chalky Kodai Senga or something against the against the Giants who we'll get to. Um, so it's one way to differentiate, and this is a five-game slate. So don't totally ignore all of this. He is off the barrel, and despite a very low strike one rate of 55%, these secondary pitches are workable enough for him that they've so far kept him out of total trouble. But this could balloon, and, and it could explode on him real quick because he's pitching to a lot of contact and having trouble getting ahead in counts. Um, so this could get real ugly, and we can attack him from from both sides of the plate, lefties and righties, 175 ISO to lefties, 162 ISO to righties, and a very high hard contact rate with two righties so far, 75 hitters, but 75 hitters, 75 hitters, and 39% hard contact is 39% hard contact. So um, some worrisome underlying metrics here for Ryan Nelson, kind of an elevated price tag for the matchup, to be quite honest. But uh, a playable deep tournament piece for sure. I mean, I, I don't think you get anywhere close to this in stuff like 20 max. Um, it's really only deep stuff I, I think I would land on this. And I probably, even building uh, a full 100, 150 teams, you probably aren't going to get very much of this. Um, if you get a 7%, I'd probably be uh, pretty surprised, to be honest. Um, so... Padre is definitely a, a favorite stack of the day, uh, of course. Um, and Padres, or excuse me, Tatis is the favorite play of the Padres. Uh, and at 2000, he's just flat underpriced. It's a big, big mistake from DraftKings. Um, it does make for interesting tournament decisions, right? Because you can play other shortstops and you may be able to get some, eke out some ownership value on that. But uh, frustrating nonetheless that they, they, they really kind of dropped the ball there. Um, let's get to Michael Walker quickly. 8,600 on the mound for him. Eh, pretty meh price tag, I think. Um, he got blasted in his last start. Uh, it may have been against Arizona. I can't remember exactly. Um, but we were kind of expecting a little bit of regression. He struck out 10 against the Braves, I think. Uh, and that's not Michael Walker. He just he has a 20% aggregate K rate. So when we pop to that kind of um, uh, that kind of outlier performance, you can expect a regression, even if it doesn't happen in the, the very next start, you can expect it to happen eventually. Um, just so happens that it did happen in the, in the very next start for Waka. Now, Arizona here um, really hasn't been attackable. They've been excellent in terms of contact, maybe not so much in terms of um, run creation so far, but against righties this season, 445 PAs, 20% K rate, 5.5% walk rate. It's pretty low. So they're not all that patient, but they're making a good bit of contact. 170 ISO, 309 WOBA, average numbers there, buck 20 ground ball to fly ball, with a 31.5% hard contact rate in aggregate. So they have a lot of lefties over here that can get to Michael Waka. Um, and he's really attackable with both sides. He's giving up a little bit more power to the right side and a lower strikeout rate to the right side than the lefties. That's because of his changeup. It's always been a pretty good pitch for him. Um, 
so we can get to him with both sides of the plate, and certainly we know that Arizona is going to platoon a good bit. Josh Rojas, price is finally coming down on him. He's at 4,400. He'll be leading off. Uh, Corbin Carroll here in the middle of the lineup. They they're, they pushed him up to the three yesterday. Um, and at 4,000, there's too much upside for him as well. He's underpriced. Cattell Marte, 4,300, still underpriced for his relative upside. Christian Walker, most pop on the team at 3,200 if he can make contact. Uh, this is a good spot for that because Waka, as I mentioned, the just the 18% K rate to right-handers, 33% hard contact rate to righties. So we're going to see some pretty good values over here on Arizona, and they're another deeper sort of tournament stack that you can consider getting to. Now, these guys at the top of the lineup, they're certainly going to be popular. You're not going to fool anybody playing Corbin Carroll at 4,000 in the three-hole. Um, but you can play a Paven Smith, right? He is the biggest fly ball hitter um, from the left side, and he's super cheap at 2,800 at first base. Got to play him at first base, unfortunately. But Alex, Alec Thomas, excuse me, at 2,100, he will likely be down at the bottom of the lineup, um, perhaps coming into his own and quieting the swing down a little bit as well. And he is a... Um, a fine filler piece if you need to get cheap in the outfield, for for example. So uh, definitely a playable stack over here. Uh, a lot of pop and sneaky. They've been very good. And as we can see here in the raw record, 11 and 8, they're, I think, leading the, uh, the NL West right now. <laughs> so um, intriguing team over here. And I think they could provide a little bit of upside, certainly on a five-game slate for us, uh, against an attackable arm in Waka. Now, you could, you could play him, too. Uh, 8,600, like, you got to play somebody on the mountain there. So, um, you you can get to him, and and it's fine. At, in a 50 of your teams, I don't know, maybe a little bit high. Uh, so perhaps some attack ability there with a v very low median projection and that ownership. Um, the combination of all of these three numbers, the salary, the median projection, and the early projected ownership, Something seems a little fishy and out of whack here, and it's mostly the price tag on him. So that would probably keep me down relative to the ownership of the rest of the field and probably put me on to some more of the Diamondbacks because um, I, I like the prices over here, and they're going to allow you to get a little bit different um, as you're going to need to do on a five-game slate. So we spent a lot of time here, but uh, this is, like, if you like game theory, well, this is a... Uh, yeah, this is right up your alley because um, you get, you have to play Tatis uh, and you're going to have to play him in spades because he is he's free and um, or he's as close as it's going to get to free. So you got to play him uh, and you're going to play him in cash 100 percent and you're going to play him in tournaments uh, at a very, very high clip. If he's less than 50 percent owned in anything by the end of the day, um, that's a very exploitable spot. OK. So let's uh, let's get to the Mets and the Giants here. We got Kodai Senga. He's the one ace on the mound that we've got today, um, and he's been good. He was bad in his last start, and we talked about this. His susceptibility so far has been to walks. He's walking way too many people, and that's because he's burying the splitter down here, and he hasn't been able to throw the slider anywhere near the strike zone just yet. So, so a lot of susceptibility. He's throwing strike one because he he can spot the fastball, he can spot the cutter. And when he does throw the split early in the count, he's, he's going to get a lot of swing and miss on it. So still nothing worrisome yet um, here in the arsenal, except being able to throw strikes. Now he's staying off the barrel, but if he's walking people and putting people on base for free, any team in, in the majors is going to be able to get to you. And we saw that. One of the worst, probably two teams in the majors in Oakland got to him a little bit. So... Um, now, 10-3 today, I don't think we're going to have to... I don't think we need to worry necessarily about the salary. Um, like, I would say he's probably over overpriced in general in a vacuum, but we're on a five-game slate, number one, and we have plenty of value that we're going to be able to get to. Uh, so it's not we're not really worried about price necessarily, but uh, also some very attackable arms and some expensive hitters that we, we may want to play. So... Um, it may make it a little difficult lineup construction wise to, to get to a full 60% Kodai Senga tonight. Uh, and that's probably why we're seeing a, a depressed ownership on him right now. And this kind of makes sense. Uh, it's not that 
I mean, it, in terms of raw value, I think the spot here uh, against the Giants, they're striking out a 27% clip uh, against righties so far this season. And the split is going to be a, a difficult pitch for them to handle as from the left side, they're mostly fly ball hitters. Um, there's going to be a lot of swing and miss coming from the Giants tonight. So I think in in a vacuum, Kodai Senga is a, a really strong play, but it might make it a little hard to get to him. Um, you know, with the with the win game and attacking some some very susceptible arms on the mound here. Now we are seeing just a 16 and a half median projection so far, and for an ace of a staff, so to speak, uh, that's a pretty low number. Um, now I know that uh, Scherzer is kind of the ace of the staff, but who knows what's going on with him? Um, they're still missing Verlander, right? Uh, but Kodai Senga for a, a, a top three arm of the staff, right? He can anchor a lot of rotations in the big leagues. Just so happens that he got Scherzer and Verlander on the staff. Um, this is probably a pretty low median projection and surprisingly low given the attackable matchup here. And that's really due to the susceptibility and being able to throw strikes. You've got to throw it over the plate. You cannot walk this many people and succeed uh, in the big leagues against any team. So if you want to get off the board here, and attack one of the most popular arms on the mound, go after Kodai Sega. And you could, it's five-game slate. You can do it with the Giants because they hit the ball over the wall, and that's what you need to win tournaments. Um, not my favorite play, certainly. I don't want to be playing a Tyro Estrada uh, leading off at, at 5,400. They'll probably have Lamont Wade or something uh, lead it off today because they do this platoon nonsense. Um, but they're very cheap as well. And if you want to or need to get to uh, an expensive secondary stack, the Giants are one of those kind of off-the-board teams that can get you there. Now, do we want to be five-stacking the Giants in San Francisco uh, at night in 55 and 60-degree weather? Generally, no. But uh, this is a five-game slate, and you can really do whatever you want. So plenty attainable to get to all of these guys. From the left side, Yaz has been fine, uh, 3800 it is a fine price tag. Uh, you can play Lamont, Lamont Wade. Much less pitch hit risk for him uh, this season. Because last season, they'd lead him off, then they'd give him two at-bats. You could just pretty much X him out of your pools. But happening a, a, a bit less so far this year, because they kind of need some bodies. They're, they're, they're pretty banged up right now. Uh, Jock's still on the DL. Um et cetera, et cetera, in the outfield. So he's going to get, he's going to get at bats, uh, Lamont up at the top, and he's 3,100. So decent value there uh, leading off against a very popular pitcher who has trouble throwing strikes. So uh, as of right now, as you can see a little peak right here, um, that is a 10.5% walk rate in aggregate against right-handers this season for the Giants. So they're patient and... You know, despite the fact that they're striking out a crap load at 27% against righties, um, they're still extending at bats and making guys work. And if you can't throw strikes over here, like Kodai Senga has shown a vulnerability so far, um, they can make it difficult on you. So he, he's given up a lot of hard contact, 36% to both sides of the plate in the early going here. Um, obviously, the swinging strike stuff and the CSW, that's all excellent so far with a 30% K rate. So I don't want to fully fade Kodai Senga or anything, uh, but he, there are some outs here for the Giants to get there, and it's mostly because he's been he's having trouble throwing it over the plate. So let's get to Manaya on the other side. Um, 9900 for him. Like, this is an egregious price tag. I don't know. What, like, I know it's five-game slate, and I don't we have... I know we don't have uh, all that many... Um, arms to to really like get super excited about but i mean manaya even on a five gamer when i don't really care about salary on the mound i'm not sure i want to pay this for him uh i get that the velocity is is slightly up a couple of ticks um this 91 is really at kind of smoke and mirrors it's up to about 92 94 now um this season however he's still having a little bit of trouble spotting it and he can get very wild and i don't want to deal with a 
any sort of vulnerability at a pretty expensive price tag and high ownership here with a low median projection, those numbers are too high given where the, the projection is sitting right now. In a really bad matchup, he gets the Mets over here. They're walking at a 10% clip themselves, striking out at just a 20.5% clip against lefties this season. Shorter sample, but we're starting to get get it to converge a little bit. 315 PAs for the Mets so far against lefties. Buck 56 ISO and a 320 Woba. Um, not hitting for a hell of a lot of hard contact just yet, but Sean is going to give that up to right. He's definitely 35%. And he's on the barrel at a 9.5% aggregate clip here. So 1.9 homers per nine, probably going to come down a little bit with the increased velocity and better control this season that he did not exhibit at all last year. Uh, but still attackable nonetheless. He's still giving up power, and he's still 10,000 here. So a lot of variance is going to come with this price tag and this ownership here at Shamanaya. Definitely not my favorite tournament play. Um, I'd definitely like to come in under under the field on this number. I think the ownership is a bit too high, and I don't think that the median projection is all that low. In the early going here, it does seem a tick low, perhaps. Um, but if you ran this 100 times, or 10,000 times, I mean, this is what we're, what we're doing here when we spit out this projection, um, it does seem a little bit off given the very high ownership and, and, and price tag here. So I don't think there's much value that we could necessarily want to try to squeeze out of this out of this low-ish projection. Um, and I think we could probably squeeze some value by coming in underweight to 30 and 35% on Sean Manaya. Uh, even though we are lacking a little bit in the strikeout department, he does have some of it, right? Uh, to lefties, just 21%, 25% to righties. But again, he's given up a 271 average, 350 Woba, and a 223 ISO with 1.9 homers per nine and the hard contact rate that we mentioned to the right side. So um, that puts us in Pete Alonso, Frankie Lindor, Starling Marte. He got, he got, uh, it wasn't scratched. I think he came out of the game uh, yesterday. Stiff neck for Marte, so I'll have to keep an eye on him. But, um, they got Frankie Alvarez behind the plate. Cheap catcher play if you want to get there. Mets a little bit off the board as well. I mean, not too many teams here are going to be off the board but uh, on a five-game slate. But we could get to some of the Mets here, and I think we could probably try and attack some of this pretty elevated ownership on Sean Mania, um, despite the increased velocity for him and any encouraging steps that he's taken to right the ship. He was good earlier in his career, but he's been bad for – quite some time now, so it's going to take a little bit more to convince us uh, that Sean Manai has totally fixed these power problems to the opposite side of the, um, or opposite-handed hitters, rather, and 9,900, even on a five short five-gamer where we're starving for some good pitcher value, I'm not crazy about this. You're, you're going to get some, of course, when you're building teams, but I'm not wild about that at all, and you might not get a lot just because the median projection is is so low at this point. So um, I think we can attack some sneakier offense here in this late game. Obviously we're going to side with Kodai Senga and, and the pitching for the most part, but um, there are outs of course, for both of these offenses here to get there. I would prefer like Senga and the Mets, then the Giants, then Manaya, I, I would think. Um, but you can play everybody. It, it is just a five game slate and you're going to get some, you're going to get some of Manaya. Um, but probably going to be frustrating to watch when the Mets uh, both you know don't put up a lot of runs on him, but load the bases six times and and put up three runs or or, or whatever here in the late game. So um, okay, so we went kind of long, but we had uh, for a five game slate at least. But um, a lot to talk about in that San Diego game. Uh, you you re you're really going to have to just kind of eat it. Uh, it's a it's unfortunate that he is that cheap, but I mean, if you want to take some shots, build some teams without him, it's going to be a very easy way to differentiate yourself. Uh, as of right now, in very early ownership projections, a lot of the, the models across the industry don't have him. I mean, since he hasn't been officially activated to the, the active roster yet, they don't have him in their models quite yet. Um, so once all of that data fleshes out by this afternoon, uh, you're going to see his ownership 
on the on the, on the site, it's going to spike to north of sixty percent, and it should. Uh, it's uh, the best value play that we're probably going to get of the season, um, and it's just a totally broken price. So you got to play it, and one hundred percent have to play it in cash. Uh, but there are plenty of spots that you can get different. Um, as we talked about, there's a lot of offense that we can go after here tonight. You can play some Pittsburgh. You can play some Cincinnati. You can play some Philly for sure. Um, full stacks of those three teams, are, I think, are, are very much in play. Less so on Colorado. Probably just one-off pieces or something here, like a Chris Bryant. Um, Alan Treo, cheap piece for you. Some guys that have a, a little bit of pop from the right side. Definitely the Dodgers and the Cubs in a Wrigley win game with some attackable arms. And, of course, getting to San Diego, it's going to increase their their aggregate team ownership with the $2,000 Tatis at the top of the lineup. But you can play some Arizona as well, attacking Michael Walker. Not the greatest batted ball matchup, and Arizona's been pretty damn good from the left side of the plate this season. Um, we can get to him with some righties, too, since Waka's numbers are a little bit, at least the swing and miss numbers, a little bit lower against the right side. Uh, and we just talked about the, the Mets in San Francisco. You can play some offense here, too, and and play the game theory angle and go after some of these popular pitchers here, despite the fact that we are lacking a lot of attractive arms here. We've got some low median projections across the board, and that usually tends toward, uh, or hints to us at least, that we should be targeting some offense. So, um Enjoy building teams today or don't enjoy it, uh, but um, you know, you're only going to get one shot to play Tatis at this price tag, probably for the rest of his career, unless he gets suspended again or something. Um, so go ahead and take advantage of it and just figure out other ways to get different. I wouldn't get cute with this. It's just uh, it's the freest play that you're probably going to find um, you know, over the course of the several seasons in baseball. It's just a totally broken price tag. And it does make for interesting tournament decisions. You will get depressed ownership on some other guys at shortstop, but uh, he's still by far um, the stone best play. So uh, get different with it. You can get weird. It is a five-game slate, and you're going to need to get weird. We're probably going to see some pretty crazy stuff happen tonight uh, in baseball. Hopefully it's not a Tati Zero, I'll tell you that much. But um, enjoy it, guys, and uh, we'll catch you tomorrow for a big slate. Looks like a 11 or 12 gamer or something on on Friday night. Good luck.